Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Yusen, for like introducing it and, and showing people you know, a little bit about some of the stuff that we're trying to do here. Um, so yes, so I am responsible for, for all the content here. But uh, so, so any, any errors, and I'm sure you're going to spot many, are all mine. But uh, none of this would have been possible w without this um, not exhaustive list of people. So Ross Brody, who's at Geoscience Australia, um, Carrie Key, a whole bunch of other people, including uh, some of the constables who wrote the original Occam's Inversion paper, um, Malcolm Sainbridge, some of his students, Thomas Baudin, and I could go on, some of my, my former employers. It's, um, you, you realize over the years, the more you know, that it's really not what you know, but what you've learned from other people. Uh, so I've tried to do a bad job of putting them all over there, but uh, the list just keeps growing. <laughs> anyway. So, I mean, the motivation for all of this stuff is um, really, you know, um, you want to get fantastic images like this. Um, you know, you want to be able to image down the diagonal. That's about 500 kilometers or so. Um, I know, I'm not a geologist. There's no scale bar there. I can see uh, Carol already frowning at me. But they will come. Um, really, what it is, is um, this is the survey that is our you know, pride and joy right now. It's about 30,000 line kilometers of data. You're looking at eight meters, uh, layer eight, about 16 meters deep in the Earth. And, you know, you just don't have this kind of resolution of conductivity from satellite data because, hey, you know, we're looking at about 16 meters deep in the Earth. It is an AEM survey, and this is good for us. This is good for our partners and the, you know, Department of Planning and Environment, New South Wales. Um, and, you want to be able to come up with nice looking images of this sort. So how do we do it is really the question. So, um, you know, when, when I think of inverse problems, uh, if you're a Douglas Adams fan, uh, <laughs> you know, I think, uh, does anyone know what this scene refers to? What does it refer to? Uh. Part of Doug's Adam book um, with the um, Infinity Drive, I think. Yes, yes, yes. And so it, it causes all kinds of very strange things to happen. So it caused a whale to materialize over the planet Magrathia, if I'm not mistaken, and a bowl of petunias. And the bowl of petunias keeps getting reborn as different things and keeps getting killed by the protagonist, Arthur Dent. And uh, you know, after a while, the protagonist, I mean, the, 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 the bowl of petunias, um, whose actual name is Agrajag, realizes that he keeps getting reborn. And so in this particular instance, he says, oh, no, not again. And so, um, you know, so every time you see all this math, you see inverse theory, you think, oh, no, not again. But the whale doesn't know what's, what's you know, coming, because the whale's just been materialized over the surface of this planet, and it's rushing towards the ground, and it doesn't know who the ground is. And it says, oh, that's the ground. Will it be my friend? So um, you know, I just want to make you comfortable. We, we don't want to be in this situation. Um, but really, what inverse theory is, is, is a little bit like this. This is one of my favorite web comics. It's, it's a web comic of sarcasm, math, and romance all rolled into one. It's called XKCD. And uh, it's been going solid for about nearly 20 years now. And it, it's great. But really, um, I think this sums it up beautifully. This is an inverse problem. <laughs> you know, as in you're measuring something. And you better hope that it has some relation to whatever it is that you're interested in. Um, if you were a physicist, you'd say conductivity. If you're a geologist, you'd say no, it's like subsurface geology. If you're a hydrogeologist, you'd say no, hydrostratigraphy. So we're measuring something in a general inverse problem and using that measurement. Because it's hard to measure the thing we're interested in directly. You, you want to figure out you know, the thing that you're interested in. In our case, um, we've got physics, so that we, we don't depend on correlation. So this is not machine learning, where you know, when people talk about models, they're actually talking about what is the thing that relates you know, depth in the Earth to something you've seen in the you know, observables on the surface. And they have to figure out what is the connection between the two. For us, it's Maxwell's equations, as, as you said showed you. So that's the physics. So we, we don't have to figure out the physics. So that part of the model, we totally forget about. So to us who are geoscientists or geophysicists or geologists, the model essentially has to deal with what the subsurface looks like. We, we don't worry about the physics because we know the physics. It's been studied very well. And we don't need the machine learning people to tell us that, oh, no, we can figure out the physics of AEM for you. No, no. It's been done for hundreds of years. We know it. We know it well. Um, 
So let's you know, go back to the basics a little bit. Large, friendly letters and pictures. You know, so nothing to be afraid of over here. How would you fit this? And, and that is an open question, really. How would you fit it? Start drawing some lines. Start drawing some lines, yes. So what kinds of lines would you draw? I'm, I'm, if you don't volunteer, I'm going to point to people now. <laughs> Say again? Line of best fit. That's that's really that's not a bad suggestion at all. So you you know I should have put that there. So thank you for that. Next time around I will put that there. The line of best fit, and um, yeah yeah that's right. it'll probably go through. I'm going to jump now, somewhere there, and um, yeah that's that's one way of doing it. Any other suggestions, uh, sir? You over there? Join the dots. Sorry. You could join the dots. Might you can it. say again. It. You might cluster it. So. All of these are valid points. All of, all of these are, are good points. Na Naima, did you? Well, I will. Uh, I will do, yeah, I will join the points, but be in between the bars. Like, don't go up. You know too much. But, but yes, yes, very good. I heard someone say fit a surface. Who said that? Fit a cubic too. That's, that's a good way of doing it, yes? Yeah, I, I would ask first why to fit that. Well, because, you know, it's your job. That's what you get paid to do. Yeah, and, and, and we do what we're told. But did, did, were, were you the same person that said surface? Ah, uh, yes, that's, we're, we're getting there. Naima, and your, your name, sir, I? Steve. Steve, yes, yes. Um, sorry, there's a lot of people in this room, and I would like to become. Pardon me, what? Yes, yes, yes. And so I'd like to get familiar with all of you, and hopefully by the end of this, we, we can. So all of you are right. None of you are right. Because really, um, it, it depends on the problem. It depends on what you know about the problem. In this case, some of you are more right than others because I've sourced this from a particular geological um, environment, which will become clear to you as we go along. Um, one way to represent this, and it's just one way, is to think about the values that you saw that lie on a vector over here. So there's, you know, if you look at it here, there's some. 39 data points with values between minus 0.5 and 2.5. That should already give you a bit of a clue as to what I'm talking about. <laughs> and I, so I, I put 39 values in there. And then I say, well, you know, the x-axis, hmm, it looks ripe for division. So I'm going to divide it into as small a thing as I can divide it into. And I'm going to divide it into endpoints, say 65 divisions like that. So I've already drawn some lines there. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. But say I had 65 vertical lines to divide the x-axis into. I said n was 65. And all I'm doing is a simple mapping from y to x. Does anyone know what a matrix like this is called? Anyone? Anyone? Naima knows. You, you can say it. It's allowed. That's your um, inverse matrix. Well, yes, it's the identity matrix. It's one of the i's. We're, we're getting to the inverse part. So it's, it's the identity matrix, it's zeros everywhere else. It's just one on the diagonal. So you multiply this into a vector, you will get the same thing out. This will be exactly the same as that. Now, what we have in our case, though, is a little bit different, because we don't have all the observations. Say, if you just had the second value, so you've divided the Earth into 65 uh, layers, and you've only got the value from the second, then you could write it like this. So you could have this row vector with a 1 in the second column, zeros everywhere else. And, and this is something we don't quite know about yet. And that's how you would select only x2. And another fancy way of writing is writing that as, you know, you've got this basis vector times um, this vector over here. And this basis vector is zeros everywhere except for the second column. And you could have a few more such uh, basis vectors. You could have the second value, the fourth value, the ninth value. And so you, you get the idea. You're, you're sort of selecting things from the original vector of x. And I'm a visual person. So the way to look at this really is you've got your 39 values over there between minus 0 0.5 to 2.5. You have you know, your n over here, which is about. Um, 65 or something. Yeah, there you go, it's 65. So you've got 65 columns. You've got 39 rows, so that's 39 over there. That's the 65 over there, so there's 65 unknowns. 
So you've set yourself up a system of equations, y equals ax. And so um, I just told you that the unknown is x. So what, what, what should we do next if we wanted to find out what x was? We would do an inversion, right? Ah, so now you're getting to what an inversion is like. So then the point is, well, could we invert this matrix, though? Because it's not a square matrix. It's 35 by, by 65, so you can't invert it. So you've got to do something else. And this is where our friend least squares come in. And this is, I'd have to say, like, you know, geophysicists love this equation because least squares, it solves all your problems. It looks complicated. What you do is you define an objective function. You say, what is the difference between y, which is, which is the observed, and ax? You create this objective function phi. You take the, the two norm of that. And then it's, it's basically a number for every value of x. And then you say, well, I'm going to set the gradient of that. That's this complicated notation over here. But it's, it's really maximum, minimum, nothing else. You know, we've done this in high school. It's just that this is the multidimensional variant. You say, well, I want to differentiate that objective function, set it to 0, and find the right values of x. And as it turns out, the math of this is a transpose a inverse a transpose y, where y are the uh, 39 values that you know between minus 0 0.5 and 2.5. And that should be it. However, this is what a transpose a looks like. And uh, that's, that's my impression of Munch's uh, scream. Uh, why is this matrix not invertible? See, the thing is, it's got all the nice properties of being square. It's symmetric. But it's got some zeros along the diagonal. So it's just, you can see this is like you know, black or white. So it's got ones along the diagonal, but it's also got some zeros along the diagonal, and it's got zeros everywhere else. So what that means is that if you were to compute the determinant, and I know we haven't done this since like 11th grade, some of us, and I had to look up my notes again to do this, but um, you know, if, if, you're not, if, you don't have, um, if you're not able to compute the determinant, which in this case, if you just multiply all these values because there's 0, you know, you're not going to be able to compute the determinant. No determinant, no matrix inverse. So what can you do? So the statisticians came up with something. Ah, there was someone who said something. Say again. Kriging. Kriging. Ooh, <laughs> yes. Yes, we're going to talk about Kriging as well. Yes, yes, we're, we're, we're getting there. They're all related, these things. And, and sometimes, I, you know, you, 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 that, that's great. Yes, we will talk about Kriging, and you'll see how they're related. What you could do, and this is something that happens in Kriging as well. In Kriging, this would be known as the nugget. You sort of add something to the diagonal, and you fake it. You say, ah, oh, the diagonal is 0, so I'm going to add a small amount to the diagonal. And then, well, there you, there you go. It's, it's not badly behaved anymore. And we will now come back to one of the suggestions that, that people said in the beginning. We can sort of try and fit something like that through every point. Um, but I don't know, do people have? comments like this? I mean, on, on, on this? What, what, what does this do? Um, it's, it's not as simple as just joining the dots. But um, you know, it, it's trying to do something else. But are there any comments on whether this is a good solution or not? If, if you had to you know, think about the properties of the Earth, would this, would this be good or not? We don't take into account the noise or our Hmm. That's, that's a very good point. We have not done that in this case. So the thing that I don't like about this is the fact that it's very spiky. And generally, whether you're a statistician, um, whether you're a machine learning person, whether you're a geophysicist, you tend to think of smoothness as being a good thing. Um, because smooth is believable. <clears throat> if you told me, oh, Anand, I had to greatest story last night, you know, I was out on the street and I saw this UFO and, you know, it's, it's, it's very appealing, but it's, it's not really, um, it's, it's not believable, you know? So an anomalies are like UFOs sometimes. Uh, <laughs> so, so smoothness is good, you know, and we're all in the business of looking for groundwater, minerals, oil and gas, or whatever you like. So, you know, it's our job to find anomalies, but you've got to hold back a little bit. So this is about how we hold back by enforcing smoothness. So what we do 
we, we introduced this matrix known as the regularization matrix. And this is unavoidable in inversion, because this is really what influences a lot of our solutions. What this is, is saying, whatever my solution is, I don't know what it is, I will compute. Say if you were using R or MATLAB or Python or something, you'd say diff of, of the vector. And so what that would do is give you differences between consecutive elements. So x2 minus x1, x3 minus x2, the last element minus the previous one. And you'd say, you know, I'm, I'm going to compute a differential operator. So that's the first differences you have over there. And it can be written in terms of a matrix like the zeros everywhere else, except minus 1 and 1 along two particular diagonals. And if you have that there, and now you said, not only am I going to try to minimize that system I told you about, y equals to ax, I'm also going to add in this term over here, which enforces smoothness. And I can't just do that. I have to know how much smoothness to bring in. So, so that brings in the, that guy, lambda square over there. And so I sort of have to select a value of lambda square. And then I say, well, I'm going to reduce the top line over there, which is the data misfit. And I'm also going to give you something smooth in the model. Again, I do the same thing. I set the gradient of that objective function phi to 0. And I have a very similar solution, which I'm going to call maximum likelihood estimator smooth. And I'm going to say, well, I'm going to be you know, systematic. I'm going to start with a very small value, almost like it's nothing. And instead of having you know, A transpose A inverse, I'm going to have this added term over there. You know, Do the inverse of that, A transpose Y, and I get a solution. And now the solution suddenly begins to look like that. This is a, what, what, what do people think about this? Are we, are we proceeding, have we gone forwards? Have we gone backwards? Have we, have we regressed? Have we done better? Opinions. Why is it better? Yeah, yeah. So we're beginning to see. Say again? Because it connects all the dots. It does connect all the dots, but, but this also connected all the dots, right? It had no zeros. Yeah, but you connect, but the, I have a big square there that connected. Say again? Say again? The, the other image, there is big squares there that connect to nothing. Yes, yes. So essentially what you've said is that this is smoother. So really what it is, the statement that I'm looking for, is that this has enforced a certain amount of smoothness. But what it does, ah, I won't give it away. I'll, I'll let you say it, because you're saying things before I do, so I'll just let you say it. But it trades all the, say again? Trades all the points, the, the same, so the uncertainty of the points that are not there you haven't presented the, the, the uncertainty. That is. The, the known versus the unknown. That, that is true. See, I mean, you're, I'm, I don't have to do anything. You're just putting my slides together for me. So how you, how you take that uncertainty into account is it, it falls in through this lambda square over there. And, and in technical terms, this is known as following a regularization path. And how this connects to what you said, sir, what did you say your name was again? Matt. Matt. Thank you, Matt. Um, I am now going to draw for you the data misfit and the model norm. And this is basically a fancy way of drawing a quadratic. It's a bowl. And the minimum of that bowl is, is over there. So blues are minimums. And this over here in a different color scheme has a minimum given to you by darker colors. And um, this is more like a a, you know, take a, take a pipe, cut it, rotate it, and then you, you'll sort of get the contours of this. And where is the minimum of that? Can, can, can anyone tell me? The person who told me the last time is ducked out now. <laughs> so wh wh where, where is the minimum of, 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 you know, this, of these red contours? Is, it's a line. It's a line. Absolutely. That's right. It's, it's everywhere along that line. So what it is, on this plot, I've actually plotted the contours of this and the contours of this separately. So the contours of the bowl are those. The contours of the cylinder are these straight lines. And 
depending on how you choose lambda square, you will go on what is known as a regularization path from the minimum of one to the minimum of the other. Because the minimum of one lies at, well, we know it's the center of the bowl here. And the other one really could lie anywhere on, on that axis. And the only way to minimize both is for the surfaces to sort of be tangential to each other. So which is why you've got to follow this path. Because if I move anywhere along this line, that's a line of constant data misfit. If I move anywhere along this line, that's a line of constant um, what we call here the model norm. So what's going on is that the only way to simultaneously minimize both is to sort of be tangent to them. So the tangents can only be on this straight line. And I've drawn three parts for you to foreshadow the, uh, uh, the noise element that uh, was just mentioned. So the choice of trade-off parameter takes us from the trade-off parameter being very small and the trade-off parameter being very large. Now, if we get back to this equation, uh, this one actually, that one over there, the, the top. The only way to minimize phi, if I made lambda square very, very, very large, was to make this term in Rx zero, right? On the other hand, if I made lambda square very, very, very small, is that what I said? No. If I make lambda square zero, well, the minimum of that is just this guy. So the minimum of this is the bowl, whereas you know, the way to make, if I made lambda square very large, I'd only be paying attention to this guy. Because the only way to then minimize that cost function phi would be to make rx equal to 0. And we know that that lies along that straight line that we mentioned. So that's the path you mentioned, uh, that, that, that I mentioned. So lambda square equals very large will take me there. And lambda square equals very small will take me here. And the regularization path is in between these two. And so. The choice of, of choosing that lambda square is essentially what influences all our geophysics. And for this, we need statistics. And for this, we need to think about noise. So now we're going to jump into some chi-square statistics. So I take you know, 15 samples from a normal distribution. And I've, I've done it one, two, three, four, five times. And I've got the formula up there, uh, right on top. I really need a stick. Do, do we have a stick somewhere? <laughs> we don't, but that's fine. Um, use your mouse, uh, I'll have to look backwards yeah. and use my mouse. That's just terrible. So what it is is that that's the formula for the chi-square on the top right over there, over there. And so for every sample, so I've got 15 samples in each row, and I've also plotted their histograms uh, on the left over here. So I've just got 15 samples from a normal distribution. And I've computed the chi-square. And look, the values are sort of close to 15, right? 14.7, 14.9, 9.31 in this case. But it can get low, but it's much more likely to be close to 15. Let's do this experiment a bunch more times. So you do this a whole bunch more times. And I think I've done that 11 times over here. And I've got the values of chi-square, which is basically you take the value of every, so say for this guy, you take this value, square it. You take this value, square it. You take this value, square it this value, add them up, and then you'll get 19.1. So I've done that a whole bunch of times. And I can plot the histogram there for you. Once you do this, that's the, that's the chi-square histogram that you've observed. And that's a theoretical chi-square that I've got in black. And so note that it sort of peaks around 15. And that's true, because if, when you've got 15 normal observables, the chi-square should be about 15. And Yusen mentioned the phi d before, which is the misfit. So say you had a VTAM system with 15 channels. You would take the chi-square misfit, divide by the number of channels, and you'd get what's known as the phi d. And you'd get a value of 1 over there. So whether you look at phi d or whether you look at chi-square, there are just different ways of looking at the same thing. But chi-square is a more fundamental quantity. Because if you had chi-square for, this is for 15, and it's peaked at 15. If you had a chi-square for 30, this graph would be peaked at 30. So you, you sort of have to keep that in mind, that phi d's mean different things at different chi-squares. But we'll get to phi d later. 
So in this case, we've got 15. That's the chi-square. So if you're in this range, you see high probabilities over there. So if you're really anywhere within an R, you know, a, a phi d of, say, 0 0.7 or 1.3, so you know, phi d of 0 0.7, which would correspond to something like 12 over here, 1.3, which would correspond to, I don't know, 22 over there. So in, in this region, you're highly probable. So those are the acceptable values. So if you chose your noise because you've, you know something about your observation. So this is the high altitude noise stuff that Yusen was talking about. This is where it sort of comes together. So if you, know your noise, if you know your noise values, which for this simple inverse problem I do because I created the problem, you choose the largest lambda square, which gives you the smoothest model within the noise. Remember, if I chose the largest possible lambda square, I'd get an uninformative model. That's just that gray line over there. If I chose the smallest possible lambda square, I would get the orange line. And that orange line is known as the maximum likelihood smooth model. However, what Naima sort of foreshadowed right from the beginning, she said, well, I would choose something that goes to the middle. And that's the Occam model. So if this was the data noise that I've drawn this fictitious contour over here, if you knew the data noise, this is why it's important to know your high altitudes, <laughs> which in this case is a synthetic example where I have provided the noise, so I know it. So I'm going to choose this as my noise contour, because that is the noise I provided. And if I solve the problem like that, then you get this red line. And now the red line does not go through every single data point. So I've taken my noise into account. And, and this is a seminal paper by Constable, Constable, and Parker from 1987, which, if you think about it, is, is really deep. Why is this deep? I've also plotted for you the distance of each of these models from the true model. And the true model is the black line. So I've only got observations at a few places. That's you know the, the blue areas. However, I know the true values everywhere, because this is a synthetic example, right? But the algorithm did not know that. What I know is different from what al the, the algorithms know. So at every single point, say, for the Occam model, between this and this, you know, for every single point, I can compute the distance, and I can square it. So I can compute this distance, this distance, that distance, that distance, that distance. And I can square them and add them up, and I'll get a number. And I call that distance from the truth. So despite the fact that the orange model goes through every single point, its distance from the truth is larger than the red model, the Occam model. And think about it. This is kind of a little bit fundamental, really. It's something about structure. And then physicists and mathematicians get very excited about these things. But there's something about smoothness, which is good. The algorithm didn't know anything. You were saying, Ismail? Yeah, so you have constructed a model and then did the formal modeling. That's that good. So why some of the readings, for example, the one at 10, the mm. 10 x-axis, is completely opposite from the actual model response? Noisy data. We oh. never get to observe. We never get to observe, say, in, in geophysics. You never get to observe pure data. There's always noise. So. This is noisy data. So, and, I, and I know the noise because it's a synthetic experiment. But for a geophysical experiment, we would measure the noise. That's why it's important to get a handle on noise. But what is fundamental about this is the fact that all I've done is, using the inspiration of smoothness, I've actually come closer to the truth despite the fact that I haven't fed all the data. Neil? And I might help you to explain why some of those values, data values that have error bars are actually flowing outside of the true model. I'm sorry, I, I could do it, but why don't, why don't you explain it? Well, the noise values you have are just estimates of noise. You don't actually know the noise at any particular point. So, so what it is is that I don't know. I just know that, in this case, the Gaussian has a standard deviation of 1. I don't know at every single point um, what, what the noise is. I just know something about the Gaussian. And that's all Occam knows. So I don't need to know at every single point what the noise is. If I knew that, then, well, there is no noise, right? Because I could just back out the noise and get you know, perfect noise-free data. So I don't. I know something about the statistics of the noise. It's a good point, Neil. I should have. Say again? You don't have 
You'd have to have multiple observations. That, that's exactly right, which is why multiple high altitude lines. Say again? Yes, yes, if you, had, if you had Gaussian observations, because there is no such thing as a law of small numbers. Yes, you'd have to have a reasonable sample size, yes, or lots of soundings, as, as we tend to have. So just a quick question. Yes. Are you able to like, reduce your delta x? So it's yes. Because like, you've done it basically at like, one tip, like the whole yes. If you reduce your delta x to, like, say, 0.1, won't then your original, like, if you use your smallest deviation, that will probably give you... Uh, uh, that's, a, a that's, a, that's a very good question, Jake. Yes, it will be more computer intensive, but for a 1D problem, it's, it's not really very difficult. For a 2D problem, you can reduce to very small um, intervals as well. So you should reduce to small, but no smaller. Because if it's going to be smooth anyway, what's the point of making things very small? So that's a very good question, and I've actually done that for you in one of the examples. So, so thanks for that. And why this is fundamental is because this is actually inspired by a well log from the Permian Basin <laughs> in the Earth. So it's actually a conductivity log that uh, I remember, because of course I can't bring a conductivity log away with me from my former employer. Uh, so, but I remember the values. It kind of looked like this. So it's, you know, there, there was this <laughs> aquifer that we were trying to <laughs> run, uh, you know, make, make sure that we weren't running afoul of the regulators because we didn't want to, for certain drilling purposes, tap into drinking water supplies or contaminated. So that, that's why, um, you know, I, we, we wanted to see if we could use airborne EM to tell us something about the aquifer. Uh, but, but this was the well log in the area. So all I've done is I've taken the numbers and I've assigned the depths. So instead of indices from 1 to 65 or 1 to whatever it was, I've just assigned the depths associated with the numbers on the y-axis. I've kept the log 10 resistivities exactly the same. And yes, I did do my geophysical training in the United States, so, well, I think in resistivities. I don't think in conductivity. It's just, We're teaching it, don't worry. <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> and to make this a little less abstract, so if we had a layered Earth, this, this is your layering. This is what it would look like. You know, there's no lateral heterogeneity. And all the stuff that's not the Earth, that's to do with the system geometry. And you could ask, like, why do we need to have a layered Earth? Because as Yusan has shown you, for that beautiful picture that I showed you right in the beginning, 85% of the data, these, this histogram adds up to one. Thank you for pointing that out, Seb. Uh, so these are percentages. This, this, and this must add up to one. So these are good fits to data. Now we're talking about electromagnetic data. These are medium fits to data. And these are really bad fits. So this is. I don't know, 12% or so of your data for 100,000 soundings from three days of production. Um, really, do you want to throw 2D and 3D algorithms when so much of your data can be fit with um, you know, a layered Earth model? And remember, this could also just be bad or wonky data. Or, you know, so you know, there's a, there's a cost benefit to be, to be analyzed. And as Yusan said, if you go to 2D or 3D, all the theory here holds. Um, it's just that there's more ambiguity because the curse of dimensionality. Yeah. Yes? How can we make sure our study area is not one of that 15%? Mm. You, you look at the phi d. You, you look at the, you look at the, and Seb will show some of these, Neil will show some of these. You, you look at the, the data misfit. If the data misfit is bad, don't interpret it. So I think what Alan's saying, this, this histogram is kind of um, representative of a very large area. And of course, this, this histogram can be updated with all our surveys. So now, you know, you, we can start doing the analysis with thousand line kilometers, hundred thousand, blah, blah, blah. So It'll still hold. So still yeah. Hold. So over 25,000 line, so this is only like, say, 3,000. But over 25,000, this picture remained the same, pretty much. Yeah, because we are not working in a regional scale. We might focus on a specific target. And then for, to me, if I see that horseshoe style in the inversion, it means something is deeply dipping exists over there. So is that what you mean, or? So see, that, those are two different questions. So say, from the point of view of a government agency which is tasked with mapping all of Australia, you know, I could tell you, oh, I don't care about those fine details. But I'm not going to tell you that, because it's not really about us as a government agency. It's about the physics of the system. The physics of the system is such that there is no source receiver offset. This is not seismic surveying we're telling you about. So what that means is everything goes vertically down, comes vertically up. And so it is much more likely to be fit by a 1D model than it is by a 2D or 3D model, unless you've got crazy jointing, faulting. And that can be fit with 2D or 3D models only. 
But then the good thing to do is use airborne electromagnetics as a recon tool, and then use ground electromagnetics and throw full-blown 2D or 3D inversion at it, right? B because the ambiguity in the data in airborne electromagnetics is, is not going to go away. The other thing is, because Yusen's done the hard work for me, I, I actually had seven slides of equations which I said, Yusen, would you, would you do it? And, and he showed you all the forward modeling. Uh, so I, I actually had uh, you know, all the equations that uh, you're cursing Yusen for, those I'm responsible for. He, he did a much better job of explaining them than, than I would have. Um, but that Henkel transform, that Sommerfeld integral, the horrible stuff, we do it such that you don't have to, but it's important to do it right, because if you don't do it right, you'll get your data wrong. If you get your data wrong, you'll get your misfit wrong. If you get your misfit wrong, anything you invert is pointless. So for the same model, that's a sky time response, that's a tempest response, that's femtoteslas on this scale, that's time on this scale, uh, axis. It's time on this axis, that's volts normalized by dipole moment and area of the loop. And um, these bars over here are the uh, estimates of data. Notice that they're different at different channels. We've got our noise models. My apologies, I should have uploaded the paper that uh, Yusan sent me, but it's just been crazy getting workspaces ready for all of you, and it's really just the two or three or four of us, and you know, we... but anyway, I will stop complaining because I am live. <laughs> um, and the thing to do now as we're coming towards the airborne electromagnetic problem from that simple you know, nonlinear regression problem that I showed you. What is the model? What is the data? So this stuff, the values of voltage in this case for a sky time system with two transients, the low moment and the high moment. Um, low moment is just something that has slightly lower power. High moment is something that has slightly higher moment. Moment is current in the loop times the area of the loop. Um, this stuff is your data. The transients are your data. That's what's recorded at the receivers in the off time, as, as you said mentioned. And this stuff within the brackets. This is the model. So M from now on is going to be model, and D from now on is going to be data. And again, for those of you who are data scientists in the audience, the model has nothing to do with you know, what you would consider models in statistics. For us, that's physics. So for us, it's just the values of resistivity or conductivity in every layer. That's, that's the model, all their thicknesses and things like that. Basically, the structure of the geology. Now, I know, I know, there's five equations. <sighs> what was I thinking? It's a little different now from the linear problem. And I didn't want to start from a nonlinear problem because Notice here, I just haven't been able to say, oh, this is some f, which I multiply by m. It's a function. So the response that you see over here, the blue line that you see over here on, on, on this screen, the blue line and the green line, that's what happens when you take this model, you take that model, put it through the physics, you get that blue line and the green line for the low moment and the high moment. And that's the f of m. And when you subtract f of m minus d, that's what's known as the residual. And again, that's over there. And we have, again, our friend, the model norm, the, the smoothness stuff to our right. You've got to do a few more complicated things now. So you've got to do this thing known as linearization. What that is is you say, for my forward model, if I change my resistivities by a small amount, so if I go back to that and I change this a little bit, then I'd have a delta m. So if I go from my model to my model to model plus some small perturbation. And again, this is just high school math. You get the same value of the model, but you, you find the gradient. right? You find dy by dx, or df by dm in this case. Multiply by the little amount that you've stepped away. And then you just add that. So it's basically the same thing as y equals mx plus c. right? So you, you've got your constant value. You found the gradient. You multiply by x, the amount you've stepped away from that constant value. And then you find your new y. That's basically what this is. And it's just written in linear algebra terms. So you have to linearize your response at every point. And this linearization, the, the df by dm, is known as the Jacobian matrix. And the amount you're stepping, you're stepping away, that's just known as the stepping away. <laughs> and once you do that, Instead of doing the derivative with respect to the model, you do the derivative with respect to how much you stepped away, set it equal to 0. But the formulae kind of looks similar, 
to what you had for the linear case. And why that is true is because they're not so different. This is the Occam solution where we would choose lambda squared depending on the noise. So we sort of do the same thing over here. But before we do that, I want you to note two things. This guy, that's this over here. And the gradient of this guy, that's this over here. So this is like the first derivative of the uh, cost function. And this is the second derivative of the cost function. These have two specific names, which you will come across all the time. And those of you who are trying to learn about machine learning will come across this all the time. That's the gradient, and that's the Hessian. And we shall not talk about these anymore. <laughs> but what you have to do is, your new model is your old model, plus the delta that you stepped away. And how do you find the delta that you stepped away? Well, I'd sort of written that, I think, in the previous few slides. There you go. There's a formula for that. So you, you, you can sort of get that delta m. All you really need to know is this bit r over here. And r is the residual, which is the difference between the blue line and, and the green line and the data that have been recorded. So basically, all you need to know is your regularization and the data to be able to get that step. You can take that step, and instead of writing it so complicatedly, you can write it like this. And this, to again, those of you who are you know, coming from different backgrounds, this is known as steepest descent. You, you basically start from a point. You take a step in the direction of the gradient. So remember that bowl I told you about? So if, I, if this is the bowl, I'm starting here. I look at the gradient. Oh, the gradient tells me to go in this direction. I, I put a little step over there, and then I proceed to the gradient direction. I keep doing that till I reach the bottom of the bowl. And so that's basically what gradient descent is. So nonlinear problems are solving repeated linear problems. So instead of having a nice bowl, I'm going to have a bowl that looks a little bit like that, So which is why you've got to do the linearizations. If the bowl looks like this, you're out of luck. <laughs> not going to happen. It happens in seismic problems, but mostly not for electromagnetic problems. Your bowl looks a little bit like that. And so you use the gradient to step. So you basically do repeatedly at every step linearizations of where you're at. You take a little step, do a linearization, do a little step, linearization, do a little step. So every time your new model replaces the old model, you do it again. New model replaces the old model. Find the gradient. Continue till you're within data error. Find the smoothest model. And this might seem a little bit abstract. So let's actually solve this problem, where I've got the observed data, which does not lie, a smile, on the, you know, on the true the true data over here is, is the blue line and the green line. The observed data lie off of it because there is noise in the data. And as Neil pointed out, we know the statistics of the noise. And um, let's give this a go. Let's, let's try and solve this problem. Let's try and start from some boring, uninteresting model. Yes? So all I understood from your presentation so far is noise is important. That's it. You know? If you've understood that, you've understood the most fundamental part. Yeah, but what's happening here? So yes. that lambda m is that the linear section that, that uh, what was its name? Tikhonov. Yes, matter, yes, yes. And then that m is the step. So yes. the, the, that part is that linear coefficient, and that m is for nonlinear part. It's basically as simple as that, yeah. Okay. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. It's just that you have to do this repeatedly. For a linear problem, it's one shot. Because, oh, I'm here. That's a bowl. I have to get there. I can get there in one shot. In a nonlinear problem, I sort of have to divide a surface like this into lots of little bowls. That's, but that's basically it. Let's give it a go. So <laughs> let's start. So these are resistivity models that I will iterate. Here's a value of that lambda square, the Tikhonov parameter you were telling me about. And here is, on this axis, misfit. So this axis and this axis do not align. These are just two different plots, um, but they're related to each other. So what I've done is I've got one, two, three, four points over there. You'll see one, two, three, four models over here. And the true model is plotted in dashed black. So when lambda square is very high, I get a very smooth model. That's lambda square very high. But it doesn't quite fit the data, because this model, there's actually two models in there. This model is very smooth. 
Because lambda square is very high. Remember, lambda square very, very high was that straight line, x1 equals x2. Well, what that means is every resistivity equals every other resistivity. And that's a straight line. And that's what happens when lambda is high. Lambda square is high. As I begin stepping this way, and I make lambda square smaller, I begin to complicate the model. I begin to fit the data better. So these two models are pretty much the same. Their misfits are very similar. This model corresponds to the third lambda square. And that model is this red model. And it's sort of fitting the data. And now, Jake, you'll notice that this had about 65 little divisions. This has about 50 coarser divisions. So you know, in, I don't know the true discretization of the Earth. No one told me the true discretization of the Earth. So I've made it a little bit harder for myself over here. So the true, models, the true problems discretization and the model I'm using are slightly different, but it shouldn't matter. And I hope I'm able to convince you of that. So I've, I've come four points. And some of you might, might think of L curves and things like that over here. But there, there is no L curve, because you'll see why there's no L curve. Because that's not an L curve. It's sort of going the other way. If I looked the previous one, oh, I, I reduce my lambda square. I increase my um, complexity, and it's fitting the data better. And I've said, oh, I've reduced it by 70% or so. Because right in the beginning, I don't need to go right to the bottom. right? I just need to reduce by small amounts the, the misfit. Remember, remember, you're, you're trying to get into a little bowl is, is what you're trying to do. And so once you've done that, you try and do this again. <laughs> this time, you try to increase the complexity. It just doesn't do it. it doesn't, none of the models it tries are good. They're, they're all terrible. So then you say, well, I'm not just going to reduce lambda square. Alpha, that's my step size, which no one tells you about. I'm going to reduce how far I can step as well. So that's another parameter that you have to tweak. You do that. And then you say, well, if I reduce alpha, then I can stay with the largest lambda square, and I can still reduce my misfit. And then this time around, you get lucky again. <laughs> Things begin to go nicely. They go down. Then you reduce the misfit again. Again, you, as you increase the complexity, that is, you, you, you reduce your lambda square, you begin to fit the data better and better. And there you go, until you've reached a phi d of 1, because the ultimate answer is 42, of course. Uh, <laughs> because I had you know, 17 channels of low moment data and 25 channels of high moment data, 17 plus 25 still equals 42, which is the chi-square, the expected value, which I showed you from the way chi-square distributions look like. And well, there you go. So you've got this perfect model. And that's it. No, I'm kidding. It's not it. <laughs> but there's uncertainty. But I think the most important thing is mild to take away from here is the fact that noise is important. I don't want to cross this line. I should stop here. And that really, yes? Is there a fundamental reason why the chi-squared is a standard deviation of one and not a skewed histogram? It is. It just boils. It, it, it comes down to the fact that for, so chi-squares are sort of, you can think of them in their relation to Gaussian distributions. If you have Gaussian distributed random variables, or Gaussian distributed noise, or in our case, Gaussian distributed residuals, the d minus f of m. If you've got 15 of these, it just falls out of the map. The chi-square, the expected value, the mean of that, will be 15. If you've got 42 of these, it will be 42. If it's Gaussian distributed, that's my question. Ah. See, the thing is, we stack data. Yisan did mention. Yeah. And yeah. stacking. Well, you, you can. You sort of do stack in every window, right? So you, you do have these windows that you are stacking within. And if you do do that, and statisticians will not agree with me over here, because they're like, oh, but things are correlated within a particular window. But even if they are weakly correlated, you will still end up with random variables being through the central limit theorem Gaussian. It is true that we are ignoring the correlations. I fess up. <laughs> You're right. But even but if you had the the correlations right, you would still though reach that chi square. It's just the the expectation of uh, Gaussian random variables. And um, so I've shown you deterministic inversions, but then there's uncertainty around. So there's uncertainty in the noise, 
but there's uncertainty in the models as well, and this is an important thing to, to distinguish. Uncertainty in, uncertainty in the noise, uncertainty in the data. <laughs> so uncertainty in the data manifests itself as uncertainty in the model. And the Bayesian way of looking at that really is, you know, you sort of read this from right to left. So it's like, oh, Canberra is a horrible place. I'd never want to live there. And then I move to Canberra, with that being my prior belief. And then I go to, you know, Braddon, and I say, oh, the restaurants here are really good. You know, the hiking's pretty good too. And Namadji, if you know, it, you know, if there aren't that many, you know, bushfires, is is a really nice place to be hiking around in. And so you update that belief. So you start out with a particular belief, and then you look at the observations. You then have a posterior observation. So prior, data, posterior. And this is just the fancy way of writing it. I noticed that I've said seismic data here. You haven't seen that. That is not the typo you're looking for. <laughs> I should have said, I should have said airborne electromagnetics. <laughs> <laughs> if I hadn't mentioned that, none of you would have noticed. But anyway, so this actually is, if you put this within exponentials, if, if you put this e to the minus this, e to the minus that, then you could sort of get Gaussian probabilities, and it would sort of look very similar. So whether you're a deterministic person or whether you're a Bayesian person, it doesn't matter. You can put it all into a nice statistical framework. You can argue about it till the cows come home, but I don't think there is anything to argue about, but, but I will fight you if you want me to. <laughs> but I don't want to. Now, these models have to be parameterized somehow. And as we were discussing, Jake, as in the less number of things you have to parameterize something with, the better it is. So, so say, now we're back in the game of having some true values from minus 0 0.5 to 2. These are log 10 resistivities. The true values are given by black. And I want to parameterize them with something, as Steve mentioned earlier, something like splines, but, but not splines. And someone mentioned Krieging over here. So if I introduced more points, I could sort of Krieg, and I could get a better approximation to that you know, black line. And why is this useful to do? Because Krieging is a very nice mathematical construct, which doesn't care whether you're 1D or 2D or 3D. So all the equations I showed you were for a model vector. In the optimization world, there is no 1D, 2D, or 3D. It's always a model vector. How you arrange that model vector to become an image or a voxel, that's up to you. But the math is all about model vectors. Same with Krieging. Krieging doesn't care if it's 1D, 2D, 3D, which I've sliced through over there. For, for Krieging, that's however many points there are, 11 points, 40 points, 25 points. Doesn't care. And for all of these, you can get the Krieging mean. I'm not going to get into that. All I'm saying is that you can represent something very smoothly, and which is a very large size, using very few points. So basically what that is, is if I have a few points, these are the same points I showed you two slides ago, I rotated the image. These begin to look like resistivity models now. And this is from real data in the Antarctic. This is the Skytime survey, which was carried out over Taylor Glacier. There's this fuzz over here, which are models constructed from little Gaussian process nuclei, um, which represent resistivity models with 58 or 59 layers. For each of these models, I can plot a, a transient response. Uh, for this survey, that was only uh, a high moment because they weren't interested in near surface stuff. They were interested in these briny channels that were running deep in the glacier. So, so here's all this uncertainty that you get in the data, which manifests itself in the model. <coughs> Those blue error bars, you've learned that's what we have right. <laughs> if you don't have these blue error bars right, and in SkyTem's case, um, you know, they, they use different noise models because they're the ones that flew over the Antarctic. It wasn't under our, um, it wasn't a project that we did. I haven't argued with them about the error bars, though I have stretched and squeezed them a little bit after some slight argument. Uh, but that's why it's important to agree on, on the noise. But you know, this was for an academic National Science Foundation survey. And in the end, you want to put all these things together. You want to put what you know about Occam's inversion, about Bayesian uncertainty, and you want to put it together. Why do you want to do that? 
Because you want to make beautiful images like this and impress your boss and his boss and her boss and, you know, all the way up to whoever else and get that raise. Oh, wait, we work for the government. No bonuses. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, there you go. Scale bar is coming up. Curl can't frown at me anymore. Not only that, I've got a color bar for you now. <laughs> so, uh, so, so this is... <laughs> Say again? And yeah, oh, oh, oh God, I must, this is subliminal, I must be learning. This is about five kilometers. Where's your north arrow? Oh, was there a north arrow? Oh, where's the north arrow? Yeah, yeah, well, I'm not perfect. And not only that, I've given you context now. When I'm zooming in, where am I zooming in? Because I've learned this after getting carped at by geologists, uh, that uh, I should be putting these things there. I have now, but no north arrow. I will, I will keep that in mind for next time. I've even put arrows showing you which side is north and west, and yes, I know, this should be northeast, and that should be southwest, or whatever, southeast. But northwest and southeast, but, but yes, I mean, there's only so much code I can write in a day. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, if we focus on this line, which is about 30 kilometers long or so, um, this is the Occam's inversion image. This is an important thing that Ross asked me to point out. This is not a 2D model. We're showing you a 2D section. But these are all sounding by sounding. We've just taken the values of resistivity, or the log 10 of resistivity, or the log 10 of conductivity, whatever, it doesn't matter. Log 10 of resistivity and the log 10 of conductivity are just minus of each other. So it, you know, live with it. <laughs> but what you've got is we've just put that into color, and then we've just plotted that sounding by sounding by sounding. And in this one, I think there's about 2,000 soundings or so. Up there, it says 89% of soundings have been fit to within the noise. Only 6% has been really not fit. So that's, that's good. And if it doesn't add up to 90, that's because there's rounding errors. But in this case, it does. So that's good. Uh, sorry, 100. 89 plus 11 is 100. So that's good. So all the data have been mostly fit. 90% of the data have been fit. You can see this beautiful image, which shows you, I don't know, Neil, what does this show you again? Yes, so these are, these are 2D sections, vertical sections, and I was, I was hoping you could tell them something about these units, but probably best not to tread where angels fear to go. Um, and then yes, I've also got, it's important to keep track of the geometry, so I've got the receiver height in this case, and uh, important to keep track of the ID or the data misfit, that's the top row. Do not be interpreting the spiky stuff over here because it has not fit well. Do not, bad, bad. Also, we should be looking at the uncertainties around this. And those are the uncertainties. And now you will tell me, oh, what is all this stuff? Well, what it all is, is basically at every point, for every sounding, remember the uh, fuzziness that I showed you, this fuzziness? So now I'm basically going to show you the fuzziness, but I've got to do it at multiple locations. So I'm using color to do it, and I'm using percentiles. So what I'm doing, say, if you focus on the top row, that is, at every depth, I've got the 10th percentile of conductivities which fit the data. Neil? How many models have you inverted here? Ah, uh, at every location, I have inverted about 200,000 models. Ah, it's a very good point. I see what you're doing there. 200,000 models as opposed to the one. So <laughs> this at every location. Say again? How long it took? That's not a bad question, actually. It, it took, per sounding, it took about 40 minutes. But with parallel processing, I can do all 2,000 in 40 minutes. So really, it only takes 40 minutes. <laughs> But in, a, in a big computer. So yeah. you I can imagine the size of this. So you have 2,000 readings along that line. Yes. And you did 2,000 different inversions. 200,000. 200,000 200, inversions. Yeah. And then you just stitched them together. Yes, but the stitching of it. So I've, I've done that here as well. Uh, for, for this, it's just 2,000 inversions of because one of one model. And it's, it's, it's about 200 forward calls. That's the important thing to keep in mind because it's, say, 20 steps. You've got to sweep through the lambda square, so that's 20 times 10, 200 forward calls per sounding. Whereas for 
the stochastic inversions, it's not 200, it's 200,000. So it's 1,000 times more computation and a little bit more. But really, what it is is how much time does it take? But 40 minutes is not that much time. Go for a coffee. Can I just say something? I think the point is, I know probably you're saying it's too much. But you can see, and I think Alan's going there, your single model on the deterministic is a good enough pass where there's uncertainty, where there's no good level of fit, we run a stochastic. Then we can encompass you know, the uncertainty around it with much more confidence. We already know our outcome and our, and our deterministic is pretty good. The Bayesian just gives us, lets us go to, to sleep uh, comfortable at night. That's, that's it's, like, sort of it's like we've done our due diligence. Yes. Um, it might be also good to quickly describe model non-uniqueness and why you would choose to run so many. So that, that we're going to do in the next slide. But what I'd like to get through is the percentile. So at every location in the Earth, I've calculated the 10th percentile resistivity, the 50th percentile, the average, and the 90th percentile. And I've presented them to you as colors over here. So when the percentiles are close to each other, that means it's highly probable. What that means is that the 10th and the 90th percentiles are sort of bunching up together or that the colors are similar. And when the 10th and 90th percentiles are very different, like over here, this is all red. And this, I can still jump, 60 slides in, is, um, is all blue. So that means that blue and red are different. They're very different from each other, lots of uncertainty. And I've drawn profiles for you here, three vertical profiles that will address the issue of non-uniqueness that Neil talks about. Those very same profiles. and. So you see that the Occam model is just one. So the, the Occam model is the blue model. It's because, remember, Occam, smooth. Smooth, Occam. So the Occam model is the smoothest model that sort of goes through the uncertainties. This is the fifth percentile, 50th percentile, or the median, and the uh, 95th percentile. Or in this case, I might actually have done 10th percentile. What did I do? I think you said 10. 10. Yeah, so it's a 10th, median, and 90th percentile. So, the Occam model is just one of models that can actually fit the data. So look at your uncertainties. And you know, darker colors, not probable. Hotter colors, more probable. So in this case, it's generally saying that we're sensitive to conductors, which should not come as a surprise to those of you who are you know, familiar with EM. Inductive EM. Because Naima will say, well, control source EM. We can see resistors. But this is not control source EM. This is airborne electromagnetics. Because of the way AEM works, you can only excite a certain kind of mode, TE versus TM. It's the transverse electric, which is sensitive to conductors, which is why every time you see conductors, the, you know, the, the skirts of uncertainty are cinched up. If it's cinched up, it means it's more probable, or as Ross asked me to say, more plausible. And to sum up. And then just, can we yep. go back to that one? Yep. So I think it's a very good point, and you did it on the previous one yep. about the blues and the reds, mm. but it also, if you can talk to us a little bit more about that, uh, uh, like the diffusive nature of VM and how. Yeah. So, so as you, you know, so Nabigian, 1987, smoke rings, you know, you've, you've got this loop of current, transient, as it goes through the earth, it diffuses through the earth, and it sort of becomes, you know, more diffuse, and you get less signal return. And that's generally true of most geophysics, as in the deeper you go, even if it's tomography, you, you really can't see that much more as you go deeper in the earth. And so you see the uncertainties being kind of low in the near surface. And as you go deeper, the uncertainties are higher. But it's not just depth. It's also conductivity. Um, don't be looking for resistors with AMs. So if you're looking for fresh water, I mean, you know, you, you can't do that. It's, you look for the conductor, look for the clays, look for the salty water, look at, your, look at all your wells, look at all the geological information, and make an interpretation. But Seb and Neil are going to talk to you about that, not me. But to sum up. Really, it's, you know, I, I don't have any more to say than this. It's, we would like for our models to be as detailed and realistic as possible, but it's like the UFO problem. You know, it's just not believable. Even though we'd like to believe our tales, um, do not overfit. Pay attention to noise models. Read that paper, which I forgot to upload. <laughs> but in general, you know, as a, as a rule in all kinds of geophysics, pay attention to noise. It's expensive to assess uncertainties, 
But it's not impossible. We've made it part of our routine workflow now. So what I will do is I'll invert the entire survey and I'll QC it. And Neil over there will be like, hmm, I don't trust that. Or some geologist will say, oh, I really want to interpret that. But because you know, Neil is diligent, he sort of goes and he goes and looks at it and says, oh, I can tell you the uncertainties around that. And you shouldn't be interpreting that. So, so try and, try and you know, assess uncertainties. Also, don't let these fancy machine learning people tell you that we can do all the stuff for you. There's a massive amount of overlap between inverse theory and machine learning. You should know all this stuff so that you know when you're not getting lied to. Because I can tell you from personal experience that people are trying to sell you machine learning to solve, I don't know, world peace. But it's, it's a difficult problem. And it's important to know where machine learning can help you and where it can and what the similarities are. And I, I hope that you know, when, when people try and throw equations at you, you're like, yes, I know what a Tignob regularizer is. You, know, you, can, you can go back and tell them now. Um, and um, you know, this is the most important thing. You can do all of this inversion. You can do all of this mathematics. It might be exciting to me, but really to your stakeholders, is it relevant? You know, so <laughs> the conductivity model, which you get from the airborne electromagnetic data, is it representative of the geology that you're looking for? And that is stuff that Seb and Neil are going to try to drive home today. And I will leave you there. So thank you very much.